Hi, I'm Taylor. I've talked before about how there's multiple ways to build portfolio construction models for venture funds. And the fact that we're saying is, hey, if I'm investing a certain amount of money, what does my portfolio look like? And how can I create a forecast and an estimate of what my portfolio is going to look like, how it changes over time? There's multiple ways to do this. I've, I've showed examples of simple models where we just assume like an average check size and allocation of new capital and follow-on capital. And we get an idea of like how much capital gets allocated towards follow-ons. And just to make the same general assumptions in terms of like a hold period uh, and then calculate the total proceeds. And don't really get into the detail of like uh, what's going on in the changes in the portfolio over time. And it's not really saying a lot about what the valuation or ownership or whatever the of, of an investment is. Just, hey, I'm putting money in, I'm putting some following money to on an average basis across some of them, and I'm getting an overall exit multiple, and that's it. That's one way to do it. Do it. Another way I often do it is I create another, it's still like an averaging based approach where I calculate on an average company, but I create a much more detailed portfolio construction where I actually kind of take an average company, kind of show how it changes over time. I actually kind of model out, hey, what well, on an average basis, what are my expectations in terms of future fundraises? What are the valuations of those rounds? What are the percentage of companies that come to each one of those additional rounds? And I use that to, cre to create an idea of like graduation in terms of like companies that graduate through each stage uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the company. And I use that to create like graphs that show portfolio graduation the companies going down. Um, and then also use it to forecast out proceeds, exits, and, and changes in uh, underlying value of the portfolio over time based upon the changes, unrealized gains, markups, write-offs of my average investment. And that works. Sometimes people want to say, hey, that's cool, but I want to show, I want to do my investments in more granular detail, which totally fine. I find the averaging approach to be really valuable and like the easiest, definitely the easiest way to get to, hey, I need to create a model for a phone with the absolute minimum number of assumptions necessary without having to, having to worry about making a whole bunch of like little assumptions. The averaging method is easiest. I also think it's the best. The reason being creating a specific forecast of specific investments over specific times, when they're gonna exit, how much you're gonna exit for. I think the assumptions that you use create some variability in terms of what your expectations would be. When do you assume that big exit's going to be? When do you think how many, when these individual write-offs are going to occur? And I think that the your there's the variability like what you actually assume has a meaningful impact on what the actual results are, what your actual kind of forecast is, to the degree to which the extra uh, desire for precision around them leads to a worse forecast. However, I do see the approach, the value in building out a portfolio construction where you're making very specific assumptions. So there's also a third approach to this. So in another model, I have a portfolio model where uh, I base it on basically forecast out each individual investment. Now, not to sidetrack, but in a tr tracking models I have, I do the same basic thing. I basically say, hey, here's a row, each, in, each row is an investment or a change or a proceed or a champ markup and valuation. And I just, I just put in each individual company over time, the day it happens, and the model uses that to actually kind of create a, 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 a tracking of the amount of capital invested over, uh, in each period when proceeds happen change the portfolio. But it also works for forecasting as well. So oftentimes when I'm creating a, a specific forecast like this, I create a portfolio model like 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 above. And basically what I usually do is I have typically some uh, base assumptions in terms of what the overall fund, uh, fund is, my expenses are, to get to an idea of like how much invested capital I have. And I have this idea of like invested capital would allocate to new and follow. And then I basically say, okay, well, how many investments do I make is an initial average initial check size. And I make some assumptions, some logic in terms of follow-on. Now, there's different ways to approach the follow-on. One way is to say, you know, I can just assume I'm going to put, like, deploy follow-on across all investments, uh, irrespective of what the actual outcome of that investment is. And that works. Additional way to add a little additional layer of logic is to say, well, I'm going to do follow-ons, but I'm not going to end up doing follow-ons into the companies I'm writing off. So you can say you're only doing follow-ons into to companies not writing off. And the way I structure this is I usually assign for each individual company I assign what the actual outcome of it is. And these actual outcomes, these are the labels or just terminology that I use for it, and they're actually variables, and I define them as variables in most of my models. But what I, what I do is I basically say, okay, well, maybe maybe only my large and my medium exits I actually do uh, 
uh, follow ones into. And so I can create some either just manually type in numbers for them or I can create some logic in my formulas where it's only gonna look for companies that have a certain outcome and then apply following capital. And it's gonna figure out how much capital needs to be applied, how many of those instances happen, and then figure out an average amount of dollars and follow on capital that goes to each one of the investments. That's one way to do it. And then for each one of these, basically, I, in this specific example, the way I created is I have a, a drop down here which pulls from the various outcomes I've defined. The gross exit multiple is actually defined by my usually my assumptions. Um, you could also do it the same way and just manually type in your expectation of gross exit multiple as well. That calculates out of total proceeds. And then I have these years of initial years of follow on exits. And all these, these, are, these are like timing triggers, right? So if you're just looking to create an overall forecast of a portfolio, they're not necessary. Like, hey, how much money am I investing? What my proceeds are? It doesn't matter when they happen. If you start trying to create a forecast that says, hey, here's when things are going to happen over time, well, then you need to start creating dates of things. This model here uses relative dates, year one, year two, year three, year four, rather than like absolute dates, 2021, Q2, 2022, those sort of things. So these years are defined using the relative dates. So I basically just roll in when the initial date is, I roll in when the actual year of follow is, and I roll in when the exit is. The exit here, I'm effectively assuming like an average holding period. Uh, I'm actually just, it's just car coded into the actual input here where it's just, you know, take the number year before and then add four or five or seven or whatever that kind of time period I'm expecting is. Same thing for the follow. Obviously, one of the limitations like this general structure is it's just made for like one follow on round. You could do an additional one which has two follow rounds, three follow rounds. How many follow rounds do you think you're going to do in your portfolio and create additional following follow on rounds in each columns and timing for each one? Same thing. But the way I do in this model is I then take that. Uh, into the forecast sheet, and I'll give you a little a little bit about how the formula works. But basically, I, these are cash flows over time. In new investments, I usually create some formula, like a sum if or a sum product or something. Something that says, "Hey, what year is it currently? Go find all of the investments that are made in that year. Go find all of the follow-on investments made this year. Go find all the proceeds that happened this year, and then flows in those cash flows over time." All of my models have this same basic structure here where you can use various methods of portfolio construction. You can use your own method of portfolio construction or whatever and just feed in the core primitives, new investments, follow-on investments, proceeds, uh, write-offs, those sort of things. Um, and then the modeling can out the rest of it based upon that. So I try to create a lot of flexibility how to create portfolio construction um, and how, you, how specific you want to get in terms of forecasting into most of my models. But for your own purposes, the most important thing to remember is there's multiple ways to do this. There's simple, there's hard, the more complex. Find the right that makes the most sense for you at your stage for the level of complexity and detail you're looking for to make decisions right now. And then once you have a simple one, you need more, continue to build more complexity and things at every time. But don't get stuck with too complex things at the beginning. It's very easy in modeling this sort of things to start worrying about lots of like lots of little things that could happen in terms of the portfolio construction. Start simple build up more complexity as you're able to, able to utilize it. Questions? Anytime.